you can put your trust in. And when you put your trust in him, things happen for the greater good. Now, like any journey, great journey, there's a plan. And if you haven't started on that journey, let me give you the plan of salvation. First thing you must do is hear the word or the good news, as I like to say. You have to be introduced to this manual. I call it a manual. I've heard uh, Dan call it a manual a lot of times. You must believe in the manual. You must let this guide you. Before I make a choice, before I make a decision, before I say anything to someone, I put this on my heart first. You must repent. You must go to God and tell God, listen, there's some things I've done I'm not proud of. There are things, hey, I can't remember. But guess what? He remembers and he knows your heart. So when you repent, he knows that you, let's, I want to do a 180 in my life. I want to stop walking with man and walk with God. Then you must be baptized. After you confess. When you, once you confess that you believe that Jesus is the son of God, then you go into this water. And it can happen tonight. And it's warm. I've been in there. So you don't have to worry about who getting cold. It's nice and warm. You can get on that road with God tonight. And when you're baptized, remember those previous things I mentioned. When you go down and you repent, when you come up out of that water, God says, I remember it. those things no more. You're clean, fresh clean slate now you're ready to walk that journey you may be here tonight and you've already committed to that journey but like all of us you may have stepped to the side but if you've been in this world long enough you know what to do you have to repent you may be here tonight and you just want extra prayer It's not that you're coming forward because you did something wrong. I don't know about you, but I pray for myself every day. But I cannot imagine God hearing a prayer from a mass of people dealing with me. That's a prayer. That's a good prayer. That's a deep prayer, as they say. God is not only filling me, but he's filling me through the masses of people who share the same objective, and that is going to heaven. If we can help you get to heaven tonight, let it be known by coming to the front while we together stand and sing. We are at this time going to have our family prayer, and this is uh, just a special time every week where we're able to
pray together and have you to uh, include any request you would like to. And so we keep those blue prayer request cards on that back table. And if you have filled out one of those cards, if you would hold that up uh, at this time so that the ushers can see those and they will uh, pick those up from you and bring those up. We'll include all of those uh, requests in the prayer that uh, Dan Fuller, one of our shepherds, be leading uh, in just a few moments. There are a number of uh, names that have already been turned in and folks who have already made requests uh, to us. And so let me uh, mention these uh, as those uh, cards are being brought up. Uh, we're excited that uh, uh, Samuel Williams was baptized into Christ on Monday morning. Uh, Samuel's been coming for quite a long time. He is Adeline Honoree's brother. Uh, and uh, we're thankful uh, for his decision uh, this, uh, this past Monday to put Christ on in baptism. So uh, look for Samuel, uh, encourage him. His health is not all of that good, uh, but uh, I know that he would appreciate your encouragement. Um, obviously, we need to be praying for uh, Josh and Kara uh, as uh, they are traveling out to Idaho to uh, be involved in helping the church out there as a part of our uh, answering Macedonian calls effort, and so uh, keep them in your prayers. We are thankful for some good news, uh, and that is that Amy West, who uh, had some tests done, and she got those test results back, and Amy has no cancer uh, as a result of those test results, and so we are excited. Uh, Amy's excited uh, that she has uh, got those results. As you know, those can be those results just take forever and forever and forever, it seems, to come in. But uh, good news uh, for her. Sophie, uh, Sophia turns in a, uh, a card uh, for uh, Suzu. Uh, she fell and hurt her back uh, and is in pain. Uh, Suzu had uh, fallen a couple weeks ago and broken some uh, bones in her back, and they were starting to mend, but uh, she broke those bones again. Uh, the other night, and so keep uh, keep Zulu uh, Zula in your prayers, uh, as well as Dick Kelly. Uh, Dick's going to be having surgery uh, this coming Monday, and uh, it's possible uh, and probably even likely that he's going to be having some additional surgeries after that. But uh, please keep Dick uh, and Marcia in your prayers. Also, Iceland Sinclair asked us to be praying for her. She said that she is dealing with uh, severe hip pain. Uh, Yvetta Wilson asked us to be praying for her. She's dealing with several health issues. Uh, also, John Loftus asked us to continue to pray for him as he deals with his back pain uh, and the weakness and immobility uh, that he's experiencing from that. Uh, Trina Wright asked us to be praying for her. She is also dealing uh, with quite a bit of back pain. Uh, Jimmy Banks asked us to pray for Willie Smith. Uh, he's having some pains. Uh, and some swelling uh, that he's been dealing with. And so uh, let's keep Willie uh, in our prayers. Um, uh, Yolanda Stewart asked us to pray for uh, Christopher, uh, her husband, and uh, comes with her all of the time here tonight with her. Um, he, uh, she says, requesting prayers for guidance uh, as he deals with various trials uh, in his life. And uh, Christopher's been through a lot, and let's, uh, let's keep Christopher uh, in our prayers. There's a lot of family members um, that, have, uh, that we've been asked to pray for. Jimmy Banks' mother, uh, Dolores Sims, uh, she's been on our prayer list for some time. She had a stroke this past week. Uh, she did find out uh, just earlier this week that uh, the cancer that she has had is, is continuing to spread. Uh, it has spread through her chest cavity and is now in her bones uh, they are trying to get in touch with some specialists, uh, so uh, keep Jimmy and his family uh, and, uh, and his mom, Dolores Sims, uh, in your prayers. Jimmy also asked us to pray uh, for his daughter, Tia, uh, prayers for her pregnancy to go well and for a healthy baby boy to arrive. And then a reason to give thanks, Jimmy says, a grandson is on the way. So uh, uh, we're thankful for that and uh, keep Tia uh, in the baby, uh, in your prayers. Dave Holliday wants us to be praying for his daughter, uh, Corinne Gardner. Uh, we mentioned this on Sunday. She is dealing with uh, some swollen uh, lymph nodes. Um, Linda Coe asks us to pray for her niece, uh, Natasha Coe. Uh, Natasha will be having surgery. And Linda says, I'm asking for prayers for a successful surgery and a speedy uh, recovery. 
Gwen Lyons asked us to pray for her sister-in-law, Nancy Lyons. She is making slow progress at home but still needs our prayers. Uh, Gwen also asked us to pray for all of those who have fallen away and pray that they will repent uh, and come back to the church. And certainly, we need to be praying about that. We need to be praying for our sister, uh, Ashley Alfaro. Uh, Ashley's grandmother uh, passed away uh, last week, and uh, she is grieving that, obviously. And so keep Ashley in your prayers. Also, one of our frequent members or frequent visitors, uh, Jeffrey Brown, uh, is uh, undergoing chemo for lymphoma uh, that he has. Uh, and then several friends here. Uh, Yolanda Stewart asked us to pray uh, for a co-worker and friend. His name is Robert Stewart. Uh, pray for him to feel better uh, and to be healthy. Uh, Mickey Afron asked us to pray uh, for a friend and a co-worker, uh, Daniela Whitesides. She has uh, lung cancer, and she has also had a stroke. Uh, so let's keep Daniela uh, in our prayers. And then uh, Rihanna uh, Lupo asked us to pray for some family friends, Michelle and Tyler Hughes. Uh, their son passed away unexpectedly, and they're devastated. He was only 10 years old uh, and had special needs. Uh, so again, that's Michelle and Tyler Hughes. Uh, I know sometimes you all are trying to write these names down. Uh, just check our website. We try to keep on the members section, we try to keep that prayer list up to date uh, with these requests that are turned in. Uh, but uh, uh, thankfully, even if you can't remember their names, uh, our God remembers their names and all of their needs. So let's join in together. Let's join our hearts together as Dan comes to lead us in prayer tonight. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this evening as a congregation of your people looking for guidance, and help, looking for healing and peace. We come here uh, looking for your power and your ability. So this evening, Lord, we're thankful that you hear us, that you take our prayers that you are a God that seeks to be close to us. So this evening, there's many that look uh, facing cancer, facing surgery, sickness, facing possible surgery. Those have lost loved ones. So we ask to please uh, be with them, be with those that are taking care of them, that they can heal. They can come to better health. We're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for his kingdom. Thankful for all those that have decided to meet here in prayer tonight. So this evening, Lord, we ask you please be with Robbie, Samuel, Josh and Kara as they travel. I ask you please continue to be with Amy. Zuzu, Dick, Iceland, Veda, John, Trina, Dolores, Corinne, Jeffrey. Please be with uh, Ashley's as, because of her grandmother passed away. Michelle and Tyler, Daniela. Robert, Nancy Lynn, Natasha Coe, prayer for uh, Tia. We're thankful for uh, grandchildren being born, that's for sure, Lord. I ask to please be with Chris. Pray, Lord, for our uh, brother Willie. We're thankful for uh, our ability to come here and pray to you tonight. We're so thankful for the avenue of prayer that's open to us at any time that you are a God that wants to listen. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
Once again, it is so good to look around and to see everybody here tonight. We're thankful for the presence of all who've come to be a part of this assembly tonight, especially if you're one of our guests. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's always a, an encouragement to us uh, to have you here. We hope it's an encouragement to you to be here and to study God's Word together. We would like to ask at least one member from each family, if you could take just a moment, grab one of those cards that's there in the back of the pew uh, in front of you, and if you could just let us know that you're here by filling out if you're a guest here tonight, filling out the front side of that card. If you're one of our members, filling out uh, the other side of that card. And then once you have those done, if you'll pass them to uh, one of the three center aisles, our ushers will uh, give you a moment to fill those out and then come and pick those up from you. Uh, only just a couple things to mention tonight before we uh, go to our Bible classes. Uh, there is a, an egg hunt here on uh, Saturday morning, uh, beginning, uh, that's for uh, ages or grades five and under. Uh, is the uh, age group that that egg hunt is intended for. It's hosted by our junior high uh, and senior high group, and so I believe junior high and senior high need to be here about 9.15 uh, with, uh, with the proper materials prepared uh, for that event, and then uh, the kids fifth grade and under get here at 10. Uh, for uh, There's a lot of activities, and uh, it's really good event uh, that, uh, that our folks put together, but uh, Ivan and Amber need to know tonight if you're planning to be here. Uh, there is a uh, there's some information on the welcome desk. There's a QR code where you can sign up to bring some things. So uh, please make all of that known uh, if you're planning to come. Also, Sunday morning, we will begin some new Bible classes for our adults. Uh, study on the book of Judges here in the auditorium. Uh, study on the on, uh, fundamentals of the faith over in the conference room. And then a class on Christian husbands and a class on Christian wives. So we encourage you to plan to be here. Uh, Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. Of course, our kids have started new classes as well, so make sure your kids are here for that. Uh, our junior high and senior high will begin new class, new study uh, tonight as well. And so uh, if, uh, if you are in high school or younger, uh, all of our kids, if you want to go ahead and uh, go to your Bible classes tonight, uh, all of the adults are staying in here uh, for our class tonight, and so uh, you don't need to, uh, to go anywhere. We're going to be doing a study together uh, for the next uh, few weeks, uh, just all of the adults, and so uh, we'll let our kids get out and uh, all of the teachers get out to their classes. Um, I, need, uh, I need several guys who can come up and help me pass some stuff out, so if I can get seven or eight guys who can help me pass things out, I will uh, expedite our class. And don't everybody jump up at once, but uh, um, one for everybody. One for everybody. Here, Dan, I'll give you some of these. I'll give you some of those. Good. All right. Y'all have got some stuff coming around. You're going to get a uh, you're going to get a folder, and uh, you're going to get uh, one, two, three, four four sheets of paper. I think is what you're going to get. Uh, and so, if you don't get a folder and you don't get four sheets of paper, uh, then uh, file a complaint at the de complaint department uh, on your way out, and uh, we'll uh, we'll pass it along uh, to the complaint department. And uh, or you can just raise your hand, and uh, we'll uh, we'll get something to you. All right, bring this folder with you every Wednesday night for the rest of your, or not the rest of your life, but for the rest of this session. Uh, bring this folder with you, and uh, we're going, we will add new pages to it uh, every week uh, as, we, uh, as we go through this study uh, together. But uh, as you can see from uh, the handouts you're getting from the screen, uh, we're talking about making evangelism personal again. And uh, this, is a, this is a subject that is uh, extremely important for us as Christians. Maybe not one that we talk about very often. David Brown, I forgot to mention. Um, we're going to go to 8, 810. I should have mentioned that before the, uh, the kids went out. Uh, but that will give us a little less than 40 minutes, but 805 and 810 on the bells. So, but that will help the adults to not think we're, you know, uh, that way they can keep watch. 805 and 810 on the bells. 
So uh, don't get too far ahead of me. I, I know the tendency is when you start getting papers, you start flipping through them, all right? Uh, just just hold, hold your horses. Uh, just, it, we're going to be on page one uh, to start with. Uh, you can probably find page one. Um, uh, guys who are passing stuff out, the, uh, the guys over in the uh, funny farm over here, the, the sound booth, are going to need some of your, uh, your information as well. So don't get too far ahead of me. We'll do one, one thing at a time. So you know the expression, right? After all is said and done, oftentimes more gets said than done. Is that the case with evangelism sometimes? Do we talk about evangelism a lot? I, I think we do. Uh, you know, is this congregation mission-minded? I think it is. Uh, are we soul conscious? I think we are. But you can talk the talk without walking the walk, right? It's not enough for us to talk about it a lot. It's not enough to say, well, I'm a part of a congregation that's mission-minded. That's not, it's, it's not enough. Not, not personally. It's not enough to say, wow, we gave over $300,000 for mission work this year. That's fantastic. Folks, that's not enough. I'm not talking about money. It has nothing to do with money. It's not enough when it comes to me. I cannot write, listen, I cannot write a check big enough to remove my personal responsibility to seek and to save the lost. Did you hear me? I don't care how big of a check, I don't, how, I don't care how big of a stack of bills we put in there, that does not take away my personal responsibility to the souls who are around me. So, Matthew chapter 28, and I know these, the, these passages are on, on your paper here, but I want you to think about these. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 15 through 16. What, what do we call those? I mean, Jesus didn't call them this. He didn't use this word. But what, and you might even have this heading over those sections in your Bible. What do we call those sections of the Bible? The Great Commission, right? It, the last words of Jesus before he sends into heaven as we have them. And we call them, we call them the Great Commission. Why do we call it the Great Commission? Because it's evangelizing. Why do we call it the Great Commission? Because, what'd you say? It's great. it's great. Shouldn't it be? I mean, we don't call it the ho hum uh, commission, right? We don't call it the, the, well, when I get some time commission. I mean, we call it the, why, why do we call it the Great Commission? Because of its importance. Is it the greatest work on earth? Is there, is there a more important work? I know some of us are, uh, some of us are coming up on April 15th, and uh, those of you who are working towards that deadline, you have a very important job. And we appreciate the job that you all are doing that are working towards that April 15th deadline. You know, Ricky's up here extending the invitation and talks about how he is the greatest teacher, and I believe that with all of my heart yes. uh, that he is, yes. right? And, and we appreciate those individuals who put themselves out there every day to teach kids in this world. They need it, uh, and they need lots of prayers, teachers especially, right? So there's a lot of great works in this life. We call this the Great Commission because there's no greater work than this one. This isn't a job that's been given to a select number of folks, just a select few. It's a job that's been given to all of us, right? Yes. Now, were you there when Jesus said these words? Were you there? Did he speak with an accent when he said them? Do you think, you don't think he had an accent? Um, how, when, when, you hear, when you think about, how did Jesus, did he say these in English? You wouldn't have understood these words if you were, if you were standing there, because he didn't say them in English. But I want you to imagine tonight that you were there. And I want you to imagine, perhaps if you could, that you've never heard these words before. But you've learned that the greatest man who ever walked on this earth, the man who died on the cross for you, who was raised from the dead, and right before he left this earth, he said, you know what, I've got one more thing to tell you, and here's what I need to tell you. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. All authority 
has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Do you believe that? Do you believe Jesus when he says that? Yeah, absolutely. I believe that. I don't have any authority. He's got it all. He's the, re he's the resurrected Lord. He's got all the authority. So he said, he looks at you. You know, he, he's not, I, do you think Jesus was reading a script? You know, some, you think he was just going, go, therefore, and m m m make, do you think Jesus was reading a script? You know he wasn't. I want you to imagine he looks at you in the eye when he says, go, make disciples of all the nations. How do I do that, Lord? Baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe how many? All, all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I want you to remember that I'm with you how often? Can you imagine, you just heard Jesus say that to you. I'm with you. I'm with you, Sherilyn. I'm with you, Chuck. I'm with you, Lonnie. Always, even to the end of the age. And Jesus isn't the one who said amen. I think it's Matthew who sticks that on the end. Amen. Jesus just said that to you. Do, do you and, and, and when you see him ascend into heaven, do you feel charged by Christ to go and do something? Or do you just go back home and say, I wonder what's for lunch today. I'm kind of hungry. Or do you feel like, I've got a purpose. I've got a job. Matthew's account, you know Matthew's account. Where in verse 15, Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to who? Everybody. Did he really mean every creature? I mean, surely he didn't mean, hmm. He didn't mean, I mean, he, he just meant most of them, right? He meant the ones that are willing to listen, right? Is that what he meant? No, he, he, he meant every single one of them. That's our job, right? We, the heading in your Bible calls this the Great Commission because it's the greatest work on earth. Now, it's one thing to have that in your head, right? It's one thing to have those words memorized. It's one thing for you to be able to recite those, you know, and, and maybe that's going to be one of the tests when you get up there on the Day of Judgment, and Jesus is going to say, quote, Mark 16, 15. Maybe he's, I don't think he's going to do that. But if he did, and you could do it, fantastic. You can quote that verse. There's a big difference between having something in your head and having something in your heart, isn't there? Um, when you were in school, did you ever memorize things because you had to memorize them for the test? But... You, you, never, you never let them become a part of you. You just were like, okay, I'm going to do the bare minimum here. All right, I'm going to memorize this list. I'm going to walk in there. I'm going to write this list down, and then I'm going to forget it and never think about it again for the rest of my life. Some of you are shaking your heads like, yep, I had a lot of tests like that. Okay, difference between having something up in your head and letting it get embedded in your heart and in your soul. We cannot allow the Great Commission to only take up residence in our memory banks. We've got to get the Great Commission down into our souls, down into our hearts, down into the very fiber of who we are and what we are. And, and when we do that, when, when we take the Great Commission and we work the Great Commission, can great things happen? Now, when great things happen, when we work the Great Commission... That's because we're great, right? I mean, let's just use the word. When, we're, when great things happen from executing the Great Commission, it's because we're great. Right? Why not? It's not our word. It's not our gospel. It's not our back that was put up against that rough piece of wood. It wasn't our empty tomb. It wasn't any of us. He's the one that makes it great. So what sort of things can happen? What sort of things can happen if, uh, if we take this great commission seriously? If I let the weight of his words kind of settle down into my soul? 
I can't remember where all of your blanks are. I, I know you all got blanks on this, and I put blanks on here to keep you occupied, right? To keep you paying attention. I mean, that's why you give fill in the blank, right, Dan? Keep the, to, keep, to keep people engaged and occupied. So you, you've got a blank here down at the bottom of this page. This says, if I allow these words to become embedded in my soul, I think it says the blank, does it say, that, is there the blank? The blank will be glorified. Is that what it says? What do you think that blank is? That one's not hard, right? The Lord is going to be glorified. I want you to think about you. Now, forget that. I want you to think about the apostles standing there and hearing Jesus say these words to them in the Great Commission, and they take it seriously, and they go out from there, and they begin to tell others. I want you to imagine Peter and the apostles standing up in Acts chapter 2 and preaching the gospel. Can you see smiles on their faces as they're like, this is, guys, this is it. This is what, we, this is what he told us to do. This is what we've been waiting for. Can, can you be, as, as the crowds got, how big was the, if 3,000 people responded to the invitation, how big was the crowd to get 3,000 responses? Can you imagine the smiles on their faces as they're like, we're talking about Jesus. We're telling these people life-changing information. And the Lord is being glorified. They weren't doing it for themselves. They weren't excited to be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak with other tongues, speak in other languages in order that, you know, they might be glorified. It wasn't about them and they knew it. You, re you read that sermon in Acts chapter 2. Was Peter talking, was it about him? Sermon in Acts chapter 2 is about Jesus. He's the one that's going to be glorified. What's your next blank? The blank will be spread. What do you think that blank is? All right. This, these aren't hard, right? I mean, I, th I'm an easy teacher, all right? I'm not, I'm not going to give you trick. Well, I'll tell you if I'm going to give you a trick question. The gospel's going to be, so if I let the word of God get down in my soul, what's going to happen? That gospel's going to come out. That gospel's going to be spread. You know, when, when, they, when Jesus talked about in Mark chapter 7, the things that we allow to get into our hearts are the things that come out, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Did you hear that? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Sometimes we think about that in a bad way. Because if I let bad words get in, if I let the bad stuff get in, then what's going to come out of my mouth? Well, bad stuff, right? So I, I don't need to watch these, uh, these rated R movies with all of this foul language because I allow that language to get in my heart. What's going to come out of my mouth? Well, that's what's going to come out. All right, we think about it in the negative. Can we think about it in the positive? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. <coughs> What if my heart is filled up abundantly with the gospel? What wants to come out? The good news is what wants to come out. So if I allow it to get in my soul, the Lord's going to be glorified. The gospel's going to be spread. The lost will be saved. Not because of me, not because of my goodness. The lost will be saved by the power of the gospel. Number four, the saved will be rewarded. We're going to talk about this a little bit. But over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, um, it talks about the reward that those who teach the gospel receive. Are there any rewards that you receive when you teach somebody the gospel? Somebody says, yeah, I'm going to get a crown, and, or I'm going to get a star in my crown, I'm going to get an extra jewel in my crown, you know, what, whatever those sayings are. Okay. Are there any rewards right now that we get for teaching the gospel? Um, does it not feed you? Does it not change you? Does it not build you up to teach somebody the gospel? I mean, sometimes we think about rewards and we only think about the, the afterlife, the eternal rewards. And that, that's, that's certainly the case. But that's not the only rewards that we get. Final thing on this is that the devil will be trounced. So last night, Freed Hardman University won the NAIA basketball championship. That's a big deal, y'all. Um, and so uh, here, here was this team. They were, they, were, they were behind a good part of the game. Less than a minute left, and they're down by six points. That doesn't look good. 
When you've got less than a minute left and, you only, and you're down by six points and you really haven't been up in the game much, it's just like, okay, let's just let the clock run out and, you know, let's, let's lose with some dignity maybe. Nope. They came back and won the game. It's fun when your team wins, right? I mean, when, when, when they're down with the last minute to go and you're like, oh, well, it's, it's been a good season. You know, they really went far and they did really good. And maybe next year, you know, you know, you start making concessions for the fact that you're getting ready to lose the game. But when your team wins, aha, yes, that's ours. That's our victory. Now, do you have, mm, this is like a dumb question. Do you have a favorite team? that you have a certain rivalry, that it's that game. That game every year, you, you don't care. I mean, you care about the other games, but, you know, it's, it's the Iron Bowl that's the only game that he really, he cares about the other games, but it's the Iron Bowl that, you know, is, is the one that you've got to win. Do you, have, do you find certain joy, not just when your team wins, do you find certain joy when other teams lose? I mean, I, 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 okay, that, that was like guilty laughs that, that were right there. I don't know what that was. I mean, you like your team to win, but maybe your team's got a bye this week. All right, we're not playing this week, but what would be really nice is for them to lose. And so you're rooting for somebody to, it's okay, some, some of you weren't willing to admit it, but now you're willing to admit it, that you, you root for another team to lose. Guess what happens when we teach the gospel? The devil loses. He gets his tail kicked. Don't you like to see teams that you don't like get trounced? That's what happens when we teach the gospel. And so as we think about our personal responsibility to teach the gospel, we, we cannot afford to just allow this to be something that we memorize and have in our heads We've got to allow it to sink into our hearts. And, and I want to get onto these other pages. And so, um, but in Ezekiel chapter 3, down at the bottom of your page, you've got these verses. Uh, and you can turn over. Can you imagine being Ezekiel? And God comes to Ezekiel and he says, Ezekiel, I'm sending you to the Jews. Oh, by the way, they're not going to listen to you. Um, you know, they're, they're just going to reject you. Oh, great. Thanks, Lord. Um, you know, can, can you send somebody else? But he warns Ezekiel. Don't go over there and not tell these folks what I tell you to tell them. And the warning that he gives to Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 3 is, to me, just stands out as, as a responsibility that we have in our own lives when it comes to the Great Commission. Because he tells them in verse 17, I've only got verse 18 and 19 on your sheet, but he tells them in verse 17, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. I want you to go to, they're going to reject you. I want you to go to Israel and I want you to warn them. Now, when I, whoops, when I say to the wicked, let me come back to this. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die and you give him no warning. God says, Ezekiel, go tell the wicked you're going to die. Ezekiel says, Lord, that's, that's not a nice thing to say. Lord, they don't want to hear me. You know, it's going to hurt their feelings. They might even be mad at me. He says, if you don't give them the warning that I tell you to give them, and you don't speak to, the, to, you don't speak to warn the wicked of his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man, well, guess what? He's going to die in his iniquity. He's not going to repent. He's not going to change. So he's going to be punished for his iniquity. Look what's in bold here on your paper. But his blood I will require at your hand. Oh, what? No, he's the wicked guy. He's the bad guy. He's dying. No, he, he's the one that deserves this. And God says, I told you to warn him. And you didn't. And I'm going to require it at your... Do you think God puts that there to Ezekiel just for Ezekiel's sake, but it doesn't have any application to anybody else ever in history? You think that's the case? You know a verse somewhere in the Bible? You, you know where it is in Romans 15, verse 4. You know a verse in the Bible that says, those things that are written aforetime were written for our 
learning. Do you think there's something there for us to learn from? You know, over in Romans chapter 4, it talks about Abraham. Is there, a, is there a good section of the Bible devoted to Abraham? Why is it there? Why do you have all these chapters in Genesis about Abraham? They weren't written until after Abraham was dead. Okay? Moses came along after Abraham was dead and wrote those. So Romans chapter 4 says, this wasn't written for Abraham's sake. He was dead. Well, who's it written for then? Hmm. It's written for our sake. Why is this in the Bible? Was it there? Is it in the Bible for Ezekiel's sake? Or maybe is it there for our sake? But he says in verse 19, But if you warn the wicked, and he doesn't turn from his wickedness because he's going to reject you, and I told you that's going to happen, and he doesn't turn from his wicked way, well, he's going to die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your soul. You've done what I've told you to do. He didn't do what I told him to do, but you've done what I've told you to do. Is there any application here for us? Do we have a responsibility to teach people, to reach out to people who are lost? What if we don't do what God wants us to do? So where does it start? Go to page two, all right? You can turn the page now. Uh, all of you were already there, but I'm giving you permission now. So <laughs> where it all start, starts. Nothing on the previous page was new information, right? I mean, we, we know the Great Commission. We're not unfamiliar uh, with, uh, with what the Bible teaches us about, about teaching the law. So here's the questions in the top of the page. What holds us back? Can I ask you to give me some answers? Fear. Fear. I mean, I, that's the one I expected. That's at the top of the list, right? Rejection, number two. Doubts. 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 Don't know enough. Don't have the courage to go do it. Don't have the courage to do it. Unbelief. We, unbelief. We've got a lot of things that, that hold us back. Well, what could motivate us? I mean, we've got all of these, and we're going to talk about these things, by the way. Um, what could motivate us? Say again. Man, that would, you, most of you didn't hear Dirk. What would motivate us? Getting swallowed by a great fish. Let me ask you. If you got swallowed by a great fish, and then God said, Jimmy, I told you, and you're inside that fish, what are you going to do when you get out of that fish after you take a shower? What are you going to do after you get out of that fish? I'm motivated now. I'm going to go and teach. What's going to motivate us? Gwen? Yeah, that, that's a motivation. Uh, and we, we're, we're going to talk about how, uh, how teaching somebody the gospel is contagious. Uh, and when you do it once, ooh, you want to do it. And when you, see, when you see progress like that, you, you want to do it again. So what is, uh, Sharon Lamb? When, when you help somebody to become a Christian, and then, as I think that's what Cheryl Ann's saying, and then all of these other Christians in the congregation, you know, f come around and, and grab a hold of them and make them a part of the family. Hey, we, 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 need, we need to grow our family, John. And once upon a time you was there too, now. Yeah, right. Once upon a time you was there. The, remembering, remembering that's where I used to be too. So we're, where do we start, all right? The, and here, here's what this line says. Personal evangelism starts... Where everything else starts in Christianity, you're, 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 you're going to doubt this statement. You're going to question this statement. Where does personal, well, it starts where everything else starts in, pers, in, in Christian life. What's that? Four-letter word, love. 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 Does everything else in Christianity start with love? Um, where, why are you here? Where did you come from? What has God done for us? It, it all, so... For me to be motivated, you know, you, you remember, you remember those, those, you know, the, the man who said to Christ, you know, help my unbelief, yeah. you know, for me to be motivated, what's going to motivate me? Well, perhaps a lot of things can motivate me, but can love, is love, is love a good motivator? 
Have you done some crazy things for love? Don't, maybe don't answer that out loud, but think in your head. Have, have you done some crazy things for love? Yeah. It, when you look back, did you do some really good things for love? Yes. Don't answer this one out loud. When you look back, did you really do some really dumb things? for lo Love is a weird motivator, right? Uh, it's a curious thing, uh, is what Huey Lewis said, right? Uh, so it, it'll, it'll make you do some interesting things. But when you allow the love of God to get into your soul, honestly, seriously, can it motivate you? So let's think about this for just a minute. I will be more eager and more effective in my efforts in personal evangelism, number one, when I consider the love that God has for me. We know this, right? God so loved the world. I mean, if, if you couldn't quote the Great Commission, you, you can probably quote John 3, 16. But how often do we let that sink in? When I consider how much God loves me. You know, that when, when you think about that expression, and somebody said it just a little while ago in, in 1 John chapter 4, God is love. When you think about God, God is love. Is that just the God of the New Testament? That's not the God of the Old Testament, right? That's just the God of the New Testament is a God of love. God of the Old Testament was, was different. Right? Man, don't, don't believe that for a second. Read the book of Ezekiel. Why is he even sending Ezekiel to these rebellious people? He bought, they've already rejected him because he loves them. The Old Testament is just full of the love of God. I need to think about, let's sink into my soul. Here's how much God loves me. You're, you, so you know what the second one's going to be. I need to consider how much love Jesus has for me. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, what? I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in who? The Son of God, who did what? Loved me and gave himself for me. In my Bible, I've got the word me circled. God so loved the world. Who does that include? That includes everybody. That includes everybody, everybody, everybody. Mm -hmm. But Paul said he loved me. And when I let that get a hold of me, greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for I know you were going to say that word, for me. He laid down his life for me, which is what? A friend in John 15, verse 13. When I let that, is that, is that motivating? Should, should that be motivated? When, when I think he's done this for, when, when, when that truth, when the love of Jesus got a hold of Paul, well, should I say when it got a hold of Saul, did it change him? Yes, it did. That's, that's a motivator. I become more eager and more effective when I, when I allow love to grab it. So not just the love that God has for me, love that Jesus has for me. Number three, when I truly love God back. Is God easy to love? Some people are not so easy to love. Don't look around. Don't, don't nudge. I'm just <laughs> thinking your head. Some people are not easy to love. Is God easy to love? Oh. Can we count the count how many things he has done for us? Is you know some some people want to throw throw blame at God for this for that? Excuse me. What has God done for us? When I think about how much love God has for me, t turn turn over to Matthew twenty two. All right, here's the deal. We're not getting to page three tonight. All right, bring page three back next week. We'll st we'll start there. We're just not going to get there. Um, your teacher's too slow. Matthew 22. So here's, here's a trick question, right? Lawyer comes to Jesus. I was going to make a lawyer joke, but Tim is here and I won't do it. Lawyer came to Jesus, testing him and saying, teacher, hey, hang on a second. The Holy Spirit just told us what his motivation is, right? Has he, got, has, he, has he got pure motivation? 
Why, why is he asking in this question? For the same reason you ask your parents or you ask your kids questions sometimes, right? Are you paying attention to me? I'm going to test you. He's testing. He doesn't have pure motivation. Yes, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said, you know, there were 613 commandments in that Old Testament. That's a lot to choose from, right? How do you pick one? Jesus said, it's not hard. Here's the great. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. There's nothing else like this one. What does that mean? That means when I get this one, when I let this one sink in, the other ones fall in line. I mean, in 1 John 5 and verse 3, when, when the Bible says, the Bible talks about the love of God, and, and John says, let me define the love of God for you. 1 John 5 and verse 3, he says, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Well, I don't want to keep his commandments. Well, you don't love God then. Because when you let the love of God sink into your heart, guess what you want to do? Whatever he wants me to do. You know why? That's the first and great. And when that one grabs a hold of me, the rest of them, rest of them just come. Does that include the Great Commission? Yep. It just comes. When I say, I love God. So you, you already, you've already figured out what the second one is. When I truly love Jesus. If you love me, keep my commandments. We know those verses, right? If you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, but do we love him? Um, look, look, over, look over in 1 Corinthians 16. There was an article on this recently, so we won't, we won't spend a lot of time here. But over the, last, the closing verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Verse 22. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, is that a big deal? Let him be accursed. Strongest of language there. Let him be accursed. This is an interesting time for Paul to use not the Greek word agape. That's what Jesus used in John 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. Agape love, putting Jesus in that love higher than any other love. And, and it's unconditional, it's unselfish agape love. But this is the Greek word phileo which is a tender, affectionate love for a dear friend. Do I love God above all? Yeah, I've got that. But do I have tender affection for my dear friend Jesus? And when I do, does the Great Commission, does it get a little bit easier? When I truly love God, when I truly love Jesus, number five, when I truly love mankind, Great, the, the Great Commission becomes easier. I become more effective at it when I have a real love for mankind. And somebody says, well, I'm not a people person. Okay, you don't have to be a people person. But Matthew 5 and verse 44, Jesus says to love who? Your enemies. Now, that's not the, the, the tender, affection, dear love for a friend. That's not the word he uses there. It's the unconditional, unselfish, put others above yourself love, agape. Love your enemies. If I truly love my enemies, what am I going to want for them above everything else? I'm going to want them to learn this. Matthew, do I have seven, Matthew 7, 12? You know what that is, right? The golden rule. If you were lost... Would you want somebody to tell you how to be saved? Sure. You may have been there at one time. You may have been pushing back against it for a while. You may have been rejected. You may have been telling people, stop talking to me. I don't want to hear about this anymore. But something finally got to you and sank in. If you were lost, would you want somebody else to tell you? Yes, yes. What, what does the golden rule tell you to do? Then I, I need to do it for them. The second greatest commandment, the second Jesus said is likened unto it, you shall do what? Love your neighbor as yourself. When I have a love for other people, I want them 
to learn about the love of Jesus. And I've got the ability to tell them that. And it, it just, I need to have a true love for the church. And all of these verses up here just talking about loving one another. When I, when, 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 if I'm going to be effective in my efforts to teach somebody the gospel, if I'm going to be more eager to do it and more effective in it, I've got to have a true love for the, for the church. And this is, uh, who was talking about this? Chair Lynn? Uh, okay. some, some of the comments talking about the church and, and how much the church is a part of this. Do I really love the church? And the last thing, just for sake of time, I'm rushing through these, is I've got to have a true love for the gospel. You remember what Peter and John said in Acts chapter 4? When they were commanded, stop preaching in this name. Can you imagine if Christians today were told stop preaching? I, I, I mean no unkindness, and I'm not thinking about anybody when I say this, but if some Christians were commanded today, stop preaching in Jesus' name, some Christians would have to, they'd have to confess, oh, I'm way ahead of you. I've, I've, I've already stopped. I, I'm, 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 I'm. But what did these apostles say? We cannot but speak. We cannot but speak the things that we've seen and heard. You, you can tell us what you want to tell us, but guess what? You keep talking, we're going to keep talking. Amen. You keep telling us not to, we're going to keep doing it because we can't stop. Did they love the gospel? I mean, it, it's not that, it's not that, the Lord just took control of them and they could not stop because the Lord was forcing them. That's not, this, that's not it. It's that they were in love with the Lord and they were in love with the gospel and they were going to tell other people what they knew. Oh, yes. Yes. Paul says, I'm debtor. Romans 1 verse 14, I'm ready. And he says in Romans 1 and verse 16, not only am I debtor and not only am I ready, I'm not ashamed. Are we debtors to people who need the gospel? Are we ready? Are we ashamed? What did Huey Lewis say? The power of love is a curious thing, right? He's, Paul talked about the power of love way before Huey Lewis in the news, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Here's the power of love. We'll finish with these two verses, these two thoughts. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Paul says, the love of Christ compels us. Some translations constrain us. Some translations controls us. The word is urging us, getting inside of us and shaking us up and motivating us and moving us. What does that? Love. Somebody says, is this the love that Christ has for me? Or is this the love of Christ that I have for him? Yep. Love. The love of Christ ought to urge us and move us. That's where it all starts. And so here's the question. Imagine that Jesus comes to you like he came to Peter in John 21. And he looked you in the eye and he said, Okay, do you love me? And he's not looking for a yes or no. He's not looking for you to answer with words. He's looking for you to answer with action. None of this is intended to be guilty or putting anybody on a guilt trip. And if it is, I, I'm on that guilt trip ahead of you. It's not intended to be a guilt trip. It's just intended to motivate us. Think about the love that God has for us. Think about how much we love God. Okay, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do with it? That's why we're having this class with all of us together on Wednesday nights, just to talk about this great work that we get to be involved in, the greatest work on earth. And we get to do great things for our great God. Thank you all very much for being here tonight.